Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Mops Pros webinar, Build It, Buy It, Borrow It, Analytics Tools That Work. Uh, my name is Keith Nyberg, and it is my pleasure um, to be hosting this webinar today as your moderator. I'm a marketing technology consultant with Atumos, and I am joined today by some of Mops Pros brightest, including Devani Merchant. Um, Devani Merchant is the marketing operations manager at Content Stack, and um, and sorry, I'm running through my notes here. Uh, kind of second, she'll be sharing her experience with Domo dashboards she worked with the two most to build. I'm also joined by Ronnie Duke, who's the senior manager of marketing operations at Heap, and he will be sharing his experience with rent metrics for reporting in a previous role. And last but not least, I am joined by Jeff King, who is the founder and CEO of Rent Metrics, and will be sharing a demo of Rent Metrics so we can all see under the hood of this incredibly powerful tool. Unfortunately, Gret. Grant Gregorian was uh, planning to share his experience about SFDC reporting and dashboards, um, the borrow it section of this webinar, and he had something come up and is unable to join us today. Uh, but that being said, I'm still very confident that you will find this content um, enjoyable and enlightening. Um, depending on how talkative our speakers are today, we have a lot of great content to cover. Um, we should have time for questions at the end of this presentation, so please feel free to throw any questions that you have into the chat directed at the person you would like to address the question, and I'll do my best to ensure that they're answered towards the end. Um, as a reminder, this webinar will be available on demand, so all registrants can expect to receive a link to the recording by the end of this week. Um, and without further ado, uh, I think that we should get things kicked off with Devani. Um, Devani, feel free to introduce yourself and take us away. Awesome. Thanks, Keith. Hi, everybody. My name is Zoni Munchent, and I am a marketing operations manager here at Content Stack. Um, for those of you that are unaware, Content Stack is a headless CMS company, and our um, primary audience is other businesses. So we are a B2B SaaS company. Um, I kind of thought that I would start by um, setting the lay of the land for what our Q2 looked like um, at Content Stack. Um, at the time, I did. I was not working at Content Stacks, so Domo was here before I was. Um, but we had and still have a, a very big, um, manageable, um, kind of going crazy sometimes tech stack. And we are a Marketo shop, and we have Salesforce, Outreach, Google Analytics. A lot of it was growing. It was um, something that the team was was really embedded in, and we had a lot of good usage of all of our tools. However, as you were growing, our executive team realized that there were a lot of questions that they wanted answered, um, just in terms of how we were doing, what our pipeline looked like, what was our ROI on some of our campaigns. Um, and because all of these systems may or may not have been connected or talking to one another, visibility across those systems was a challenge. And because of that, the answers tended to be super fragmented, confusing, um, and didn't align across systems. Um, added to this were all of sort of our data issues, which was either missing or inaccurate, stuff that we wanted to know more about, um, the data just didn't exist. So our infrastructure was not able to necessarily answer all of the questions that we had at the time. In short, it made for a very um, challenging environment because we didn't have confidence into our data because there was no single source of truth that we could all buy into and have a reasonable degree of confidence that this is truly how we are doing. Um, all of the built-in reporting from all of our existing systems could be inadequate and it didn't necessarily align across systems, like I said. Added to this was sort of all of the fuel to fire, right? We had a very small uh, marketing team and we struggled to identify campaigns that were performing well. Um, we didn't have campaign influence reporting. Um, the pipeline ROI numbers were all over the place. We didn't know what was driving traffic, what was driving conversions and what we should do more of or what we should think about sunsetting. At the end of the day, we were just doing really basic reporting off of singular fields um, in Salesforce and we wanted to do more. Um, this was not just a marketing problem. This sort of um, extended into other departments across the team as well. Customer success wanted a way to identify accounts that were more sketches for churn. Um, the product team wanted to see how, how you know, our users were doing with terms of user adoption and just see usage data across so that we could identify our power users as well as encourage those users that didn't necessarily use our product as much just to get them more, so to speak, sticky. Um, 
And the sales team entirely relied on those singular Salesforce metrics for full funnel analytics. And there were a lot of data issues, um, oftentimes either missing or inadequate or different sales teams use different um, fields to report off of the same metrics. So basically, it was a little bit like our favorite MOPS meme, which everybody has seen and has identified and related to at one point in time. And we realized that while we wanted to solve marketing problems, we really wanted to do more and we wanted to sort of extend our usage into something that was business intelligence. We wanted more reporting than what our existing systems could provide, but we also wanted to see um, sort of trend and pattern year over year holistic um, performance reporting so that we could decide how we were tracking against our goals, how we needed to allocate resources and get a better idea of overall marketing and sales performance. From my understanding, the team at the time had the foresight to evaluate a bunch of different tools, but we settled on Domo because of its flexibility and the ability to address all the questions that we had at the time. But it was also a tool that could grow with us as we grew and scaled our business. So we definitely had an, a mentality of we want to build for now, but we also want to build for future just because it's so much work onboarding a new tool and then sunsetting it and then starting from scratch. Um, and then we had an existing engagement with Itumos, and that sort of accelerated our, our time to value um, from Domo because they were able to assist us in building a lot of our, our initial dashboards and be able to sort of really talk to our story um, in terms of all of the different things that we were doing, whether that be good, bad, or ugly. That worked out pretty well for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were able to get a lot of advanced reporting, which was, which essentially was really exciting for the whole team because we, we got all of the different information that we needed for marketing and sales, but also, um, you know, the entire team across other departments has taken Domo of fish like water. But there's, there's always a little bit of a catch. Um, we've, we've really embraced our usage of Domo, but we've also learned some really important lessons along the way. Um, importantly, for better or worse, Domo surfaces everything. And the takeaway from that is we don't need to be surprised. What I mean by that is it's often gonna show you challenges with your process or your data or both. Um, and then obviously, you know, the organization has to sort of be ready to confront that and say, we are willing to do what it takes to fix it so that our data is cleaner, our reporting is more accurate, and we have confidence in what is our plan forward. So that is definitely um, really important um, to keep in mind. Um, but it's also a really good thing, right? Because then you know how you're doing and what you need to fix. Um, additionally, Domo does not, or at least it hasn't for us, taken away from doing reporting that's ad hoc. Um, Domo is really good for, for a holistic performance, um, year over year cohort analysis, all of that stuff. It's really good in terms of giving you a big picture view, but that doesn't necessarily take away from ad hoc reporting that you may need to run. Um, like say, in, for instance, like an in email performance, you may be able to build a lot of that in Domo and that's our eventual goal as well as we continue to iterate. But sometimes you have to kind of evaluate if the juice is worth the squeeze and if it's faster, um, and gets you the same amount of data that you need. Its flexibility is also its curse. Um, because it can do so much, you might need to prioritize what is really important to the business. What are your wants versus your needs? Um, for us, we wanted a lot of holistic reporting, which we've been able to build. And now we are getting more into stuff like email, performance reporting, and things like that, our operational dashboards. Those are the sort of things that we are building now, but that was not something that we needed in the beginning. So that is really important. And obviously stretching usage of Domo beyond marketing and sales. Domo can be overwhelming. Um, it is a lot. It is uh, not as, it can not be as intuitive as, as Salesforce or Marketo reporting or, or any other marketing automation platform reporting. 
Um, there's a lot of it in terms of the person that is going to manage it and live in it, as well as for everybody else that uses Domo to get data and make decisions off of it. So user adoption, training, and ownership will definitely need um, special attention so that you can ensure that you're using Domo to um, its maximum capacity. Uh, Domo is a potted plant. This is one of my favorite analogies. Um, much like our potted plants need a little bit of sun, a little bit of water, a little bit of shade. Um, Domo is pretty much exactly like that. Um, it does need somebody to maintain it, um, manage it, as well as um, extend its usage beyond the team. Um, and you're going to need somebody to iterate stories in there so that you're using Domo to its, its fullest capacity. Are we at our happily ever after today? Like I said, almost. Um, we 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 are still waiting to build some of our our more at the time earlier, which was our want, is now become our need in terms of um, email performance reporting, uh, building out more operational dashboards, um, all of the product usage and user adoption. So we are almost there at a stage where we get a lot of value out of it and all of our reporting moves to Domo. But for now, we have a lot of full funnel analytics that both marketing and sales use, including all of the lead to cash reporting, campaign performance, our MQL journey, et cetera. Um, Product and customer success have really morphed into power users of Domo because all of our product information is now piped directly into Domo. So we are able to stitch together all sorts of data um, and we are really able to thread the needle from a lead to customer and beyond. Um, obviously our finance team has also really um, adopted Domo and a lot of our board level reporting now lives in Domo as well. So. Um, yeah, I think that's sort of our experience at Domo and uh, happy to answer any more questions that you guys have. Thank you so much. Um, I think for now, Devani, we'll just save some questions for the end. I do see one that came in from Lauren that we'll address later on. As a reminder okay. to everybody, uh, love the questions. So feel free to put them in the, the question and answer section or in chat if you have to. Um, but let's we'll keep moving on for now. Um, next, I'm going to pass it over to Ronnie. Ronnie, do you want to introduce your, yourself to everybody and take it away? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Ronnie Duke. I'm the Senior Manager of Marketing Operations at a company called Heap. Uh, I actually just joined Heap a couple of months ago. So really, everything that I'm going to be talking about is uh, within the context of my previous engagement at a company called Invoice Pay, uh, where we use ramp, met ramp metrics pretty heavily. Um, although I will say I'm hoping to <laughs> onboard ramp metrics pretty soon here at, at Heap as well. So um, that'll be that'll be nice. So similar to Devani, I mean, we were in a similar place um, when I joined at Invoice Pay. So we had um, we had been doing all kinds of content marketing, a bun bunch of different areas. You know, we had a full content hub, we had our website, we had um, you know doing promotions through through paid ads and through G two Crowd and you know all kinds of things. And uh, the analytics and the reporting on the downstream effects of those content engagements were really you know slim. Uh, I would say slim to none, but just just in sort of these macro categories. So, for example, in Salesforce on the opportunity, you know, these opportunities had a lead source that were categorized in these sort of macro buckets. You know, did they come from marketing or did they come from sales? Because that's really like all they were able to know at the time. Um, you know, they didn't really have the ability to, to, to have the detail of what actually brought in those leads or what, what uh, powered those opportunities. Um, all the individual content, we had hundreds of uh, blog posts and um, resources like ebooks and white papers and webinars. And none of that was, was tracked on an individual basis. It was just all kind of flowed in like, okay, we just knew it came from the website. Um, we didn't have a, a funnel to really track, you know, and date stamp and cohort the different stages of, you know, when someone engaged versus when someone MQL'd uh, became an opportunity and, and became ultimately a customer. So we weren't able to track that entire journey just from a funnel standpoint either. Um, and the conversion rates, just because of that, weren't able to be accurately measured. We weren't able to, to tell like how many people, you know, engage, engage in something and, you know, ended up becoming an MQL and of that, how many MQLs become, became opportunities. So we just really didn't know um, how to, to report on those different types of conversion rates throughout the funnel. Um, and then, you know, some of us, you know, we have used Salesforce and realized that there's the opportunity influence uh, in Salesforce, you know, that could be a little misleading because of, you know, issues like double counting and, you know, just things that weren't really, um, 
you know, accurate in terms of being able to uh, apply the ROI and the actual attribution uh, for different engagements in Salesforce. So I want to take a few slides and just sort of um, show how and why marketing analytics was broken for us and kind of the things that we were thinking about when it came to trying to solve these issues. So one of the first things is that when I started, you know, these, these questions that came to me just weren't clearly defined. You know, we had execs that came and um, asked for reports and the, this, the terms were so vague, like, you know, how are we doing this quarter or, you know, what's working or where are our leads coming from? Or my personal favorite is, so are we moving the needle? You know, it's, and it's not like these aren't bad things to like talk about from a very high level, but it became really difficult to say, like, well, what do you mean by working? Like, how, how to define that for me, you know, are you talking about content that is uh, driving opportunities or converting leads from, from unknown to known? Like we just need to start getting in and defining, you know, some of these terms. And so the next piece of that, where that goes is like, okay, well, these terms and these words, you know, sometimes mean different things to different people. So for source, you know, we had uh, that uh, lead source on the opportunity and that was just really a macro uh, sales versus marketing. Um, so it's like, are you talking about, you know, traffic source or, or content source? Um, you know, there could be, or, or just even a list source, if it came from Zoom Info or Discover Org or something like that, like, you know, we needed to kind of define what do we mean, what do we mean when we talk about source of, of these leads or opportunities. Uh, ROI is another one. So I know in the paid world, you know, we talk about ROI, a lot of times people are referring to the amount of leads generated from a particular um, ad campaign or something. Well, other times people might talk about, okay, well, what's the downstream effect of that? Like, what's the actual ROI in terms of dollars? You know, we spent this much on ads and we got this much in revenue. You know, there's, there's a different way to, to look at ROI in those different vantage points. Um, for engagement, you know, are we talking about like a, something as simple as an email or, or a website click? Or are we talking about a more substantial engagement, like a form fill or, or a webinar attendee? You know, how are we defining that? Uh, for attribution, are we talking about, are we attributing uh, the lead, you know, getting created or the lead, what drove the MQL? What drove the opportunity? First touch, last touch, like there's different ways to quantify, you know, attribution and, and talk about that. Uh, conversion, you know, we're talking about, again, whether or not we, it was a lead conversion, you know, getting from an, an unknown to a known lead, or is it a conversion to an MQL or an opportunity or some other stage of the funnel? And it's not like any of these are just one way to look at it. I mean, they're all valid, but it's just trying to understand the context of each one as we're talking about them so that everyone's on the same page and we know what we're talking about when we're reporting some of the numbers. So another thing we ran into is that this, the data was incomplete. You know, we had different um, acquisition channels. So, you know, we had, like I said, we had our website, we had our, our content hub, which was on Uberflip. Uh, we had leads coming in from G2 Crowd. We had um, other landing pages that were capturing and sending leads into Marketo from, from an API. Um, you know, we had all kinds of different ways uh, that came in and including online and offline sources. So we had also trade shows and we had um, partner events and, you know, things like that, that just all came in, you know, in different ways into these various systems that were not all funneled into the same, um, you know, the same end, you know, source that we could, we could uh, look at and analyze. And just the uh, marketing stack alignment between them, you know, looking at, um, you know, how data was flowing from this third party system into Marketo and into Salesforce and, you know, making sure that they're all uh, flowing in, in the right way. So after that, we kind of had this phenomenon, you know, once we started aligning some of these systems and we got more data into the system, we kind of switched into a, a new mode of having too much data to look at, you know, to make, you know, any, any substantial meaning, like every, you know, app had its own kind of dashboard and reporting on things in sort of a different way. Uh, some systems, you know, like our, our content hub was showing this many uh, conversions and Marketo was showing something else, you know, and so just trying to, um, you know, figure out like what what all can we do to um, make sure that we're we're talking about things in the same way and talking and making sure that we're looking at the right data and, and talking about it in the right way. So 
So then we turn to these internal tools, um, kind of like Devani was saying, you know, each app had its own way of looking at something. Um, Salesforce had its reports, Marketo has its kind of reports. And um, there's a lot of you know, challenges that can come with each of those. So, you know, when you look at these in, in the, the context, you know, can be lacking or, or misleading. So, you know, for example, the engagement score in Marketo, you know, it says right in the documentation that it's based on a proprietary algorithm, you know, to give you that score. And I mean, yeah, when you're com comparing things, you know, stack ranks side by side, I mean, that's, that's fine, you know, to look at that way, but, you know, without knowing like what levers to pull within each one of those, you know, like I couldn't go to my, my exec team and say, man, our, our nurture is doing a, you know, 78 right now, but we're really hoping to get to an 82 by next quarter. Like, it just doesn't work that way. They're like, well, what, what's not working about it? Is it, is it opens? Is it clicks? Like, you know, there's all kinds of different things that, you know, when you dive into how to actually uh, fix the issue and, and, and raise those scores, you know, that can be challenging. Um, a lot of times it's one dimensional um, in each of these apps. So, you know, Marketo has its program uh, channel. Um, you know, it can be, it's, it's based on a lot of times just the type of content that it is, um, not necessarily the traffic source or the, um, you know, just, just some different aspects of the, the engagement that comes in, you know, and all that kind of flows into, you know, if you're used to using something like lead source, uh, a lot of times people just circle around, you know, one dimension of lead source being like the content or the, or the channel that it came in. There's also this thing that I, I kind of figured out that there's like this tunnel vision sometimes, you know, within these apps. So to give an example, uh, we used Uberflip and I remember uh, they were just rolling out their new analytics dashboards and they were really excited about it. And they came to us and say, yeah, we want to show you like our cool new analytics and everything. And so we schedule a meeting with our CSM and we look at everything and they start pulling up those reports and, um, and it was like these uh, traffic source reports and it was like 80, high 80% 80 of the traffic uh, from Uberflip came from invoicepay.com. And, you know, when you think of the context of how, where Uberflip exists, you know, it's on a subdomain, you know, it's its own platform. So content.invoicepay.com. And so to get to it, you know, unless you're, you're coming organically, you come in from, you know, you're on invoice pay and you click on resources and that pushes you over to your, our Uberflip content hub. So of course, you know, a high percentage of our traffic is coming from our own website. But my, my first question was like, well, but what got them to our website? You know, that's what I want to know. And, oh, well, we don't have a cross-site tracking script or, or anything like that. So we just don't know. So it just provided very little value because it was only looking at it in the context of itself. Um, you know, lack of control uh, can be one that when you go through and, and you're trying to uh, run these out of the box reports and everything, you know, you can't really like account for different nuances, like, you know, whether they're employees or our competitors or, you know, like just different things that might be able to skew your, your and metrics based on, you know, human knowledge and, and context behind, you know, some of this data that you're, you're trying to pull. So then of course there's the human error aspect of it, right? So, you know, even if you have like all of your, um, your Marketo campaigns and, and programs set up for like every single different, you know, content with every single different channel, every different source and, you know, all these types of things, uh, one day or another, you know, someone's gonna forget to turn that smart campaign on or, um, you know, forget to, to actually create a program that matches a new white paper that was just launched or, you know, there's all these kind of different like human aspects, you know, we're all human, it just, it just happens. Um, you know, there's also the the UTM tagging, you know, component of it. So, you know, people are, are sharing links. We had people sharing links with, you know, third party partners uh, that were saying on email on our behalf or something like that. And there wasn't any kind of, you know, tags or anything uh, associated with that. Um, there could also be the opposite of that. So I actually notice, you know, situations where there's UTMs on internal links in our own website linking to other things in our website. So you know, that can also, you know, cause issues when you're trying to track like original sources and, and stuff like that um, with, within, your, within your journeys. 
Uh, and then obviously, you know, mops has turnover sometimes. So when, you know, you, you have something up, you could have it set up completely perfect, but the next person that comes in, you know, they may do things a different way and they start deviating away from, you know, what was set up. And so, you know, over the course of time for a larger company, you could have evidence of, you know, two, three, four different ways of, of past people doing something. And so it's not all, you know, there's no governance there. It's not all streamlined into the same, same way. So all of these things kind of led us into uh, looking for ways to, to better report on, you know, these journeys, these engagements, um, applying to our funnel once we got funnel built. Um, and so this is why we uh, landed on RAM metrics. So we chose RAM metrics because the way that it's set up, you, it does automatic online campaign tracking. So we didn't have to go through and manually build, you know, any kind of um, per content, per channel, um, anything like that. Um, it has data enforcement. So as things come in, it doesn't recognize, you know, uh, what it is. There's data cleaning for UTM's landing pages, automatic uh, capturing of the content, uh, content type, content name all within that touch point. Uh, everything flowed into Salesforce. So we were Marketo Salesforce shop. So uh, it made it nice for our sales ops team that, you know, if they wanted to do any kind of further analysis or BI tool on top of the data, everything flowed into Salesforce campaigns. So it was all there, um, you know, nothing was hidden in, it, you know, in its own warehouse or anything like that. Um, and it allowed us to view things in, in a lot of different ways. So you know, the context of, you know, the different questions that we were trying to answer, you know, whether, you know, we're looking at it from a content perspective or a traffic uh, perspective, um, or if we wanted to see overlays, you know, on our funnel and different engagements to different stages of our funnel. Um, you know, there's just these different screens that just made it really easy for, you know, myself and the team to go in and, and know like what it is we're looking at at that time. Like if it's red, I know we're talking about engagements. If it's purple, I know we're talking about NQLs. Like I'm a very visual person. So, um, you know, just, just paint by numbers uh, in, in that sense is, uh, was really useful. Um, it also allowed us to change our attribution models on the fly. So, you know, if we're looking at things like MQL, we may want to look at like last touch before MQL to, to, to answer the question of why we or what actually drove the MQL, um, you know, and then same thing for at any other stage, if it's opportunities, we could look at first touch, last touch, just with a flip of the button, you know, in the app. Um, and then the native Salesforce fields, um, you know, everything was, we were able to custom map, um, you know, our uh, selection of fields that we wanted in our Salesforce. So if we had things like, you know, uh, opportunity type, you know, whether it was a new business or onboarding or, you know, different locations and, and rooftops for, for companies that have multiple locations, you know, we're able to bring that in. And so that way we can add that additional context um, into, into the app. <clears throat> going to go to the next slide. So everything that comes in uh, just all gets captured in this single touch point and that we didn't, you know, the data structure was already provided and we didn't have to like build or, or upload anything that, uh, that built, that, that manages this. And so everything that comes in, it automatically knows, you know, based on uh, the tracking script that everything that is, uh, you know, has UTMs, it'll, it'll calculate that, um, script that from the URLs from the first visit. Um, if it came from a refer, like it knows if it was from a, a third party source of social media or, um, or, uh, or, or organic, you know, things like that, all the UTMs and all that, like all that comes in as a single touch point. And then uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So this made it so we didn't have to worry if uh, some things, you know, either got missed, like there was a medium, but not a source or something like that. We could go in and fix it, you know, as things come in and there are so or if, uh, things were misspelled or used in a different order. Um, you know, we could go in and, and match that. And it's just like kind of this data governance, like right at the front door. And we got an alert, we get an alert when, um, these sort of things come up and then we just map it. So, you know, if it should be like, you know, the source should be just Google, you know, or AdWords or something like that, we could just map it to whatever exists or create our own source or something like that on the fly and it just fixes it. 
And then again, just uh, having these different screens, you know, throughout the app just made it really useful to help um, you know, talk about these things with the team, you know, there's these different content screens, there's, tra you know, traffic, uh, or you could look at, you know, your filters based on, you know, content or traffic, or uh, you can look at engage, or there's an MQL screen or opportunity data screens, you know, all those, uh, like, kind of help you tell that story visually throughout the app, which we found, found to be nice. So it's an example of the, uh, all the opportunities that came in um, from uh, that, that were in our Salesforce, we could see like all the touches in chronological order, um, you know, all the fractional calculations, you know, did that all automatically based on our uh, attribution model. So similar to what Devani was saying, like, you know, there's always a little bit of a catch or really just things to think about, you know, if you're looking to um, buy a tool, to solve this problem is obviously, you know, with a new app comes a new cost. So something to think about. Um, I will say that out of all the tools that we evaluate around metrics did end up being the, the best thing for our buck and most, most cost effective tool. Um, there, there could be this, this kind of environment of just trying to teach users a new tool. Like, you know, they're used to seeing just lead source in one area. Um, you know, you might have to just sort of teach them sort of this other way to think about a multi-touch, multi-dimensional approach to, to analytics. Um, you know, some processes might have to change, you know, if you're not used to using, you know, UTMs on everything, uh, that might be just, just something that you have to train your team to, to use um, a little bit more um, robustly and, you know, create you know, either a UTM tracking spreadsheet or something like that. Um, or the usage of Salesforce campaigns, you know, if you're not <laughs> used to using those um, for your like trade shows and with, especially with the right, you know, statuses and uh, responded statuses and everything. So all those are kind of like things that, you know, just operational changes to keep in mind. Uh, and then just thinking about data differently can be a little uncomfortable at first. So, you know, we were really like um, hot on trying to just look at lead source as the, the source of truth when we were having these conversations. And so it took a little bit of time to kind of get my team, you know, away from thinking about that and just think of like more of a um, influence model and like a true multi-touch attribution model. Um, is not just a single answer, you know, it's like it's it's the answer is depending on the context of how you're asking the question. So um, there could be some internal conversations that, uh, that might need to drive that. And that's all I had. So thank you guys very much um, for that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ronnie. That was really incredible, really great detail. Um, and I'm sure everybody that's on the webinar right now enjoyed that. Um, last but not least, uh, we're going to pass it over to Jeff King. I think uh, per Ronnie's presentation, we would all love to see a little bit under the hood uh, inside Brent Metrics. And so Jeff, um, if you want to grab screen share here, Ali, if you could pass that over, uh, we'd love to see a look inside the tool. All right. Th thanks, Keith. Let's see. Where if you mean to grab it? Okay. Yeah. And as a reminder for everybody, keep those questions coming. We're going to address them towards the end. Um, love the interaction. Exactly. All right. OK, on screen, share the key? Yes, it is. OK. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, thanks, Key. Th thanks, uh, thanks for checking this out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the founder of Rent Metrics. My style is I'm kind of like a problem solver, kind of uh, my role. So I work with customers. Uh, I help with product design. Um, I listen to kind of what's going on in marketing ops. So I, I get a lot of people like Ronnie. Uh, you know, if if someone has a feature request, we try to you know kind of make it happen. Uh, so I'm, we're definitely in the weeds of, uh, you know, marketing analytics and what's the marketing ROI and those kind of things. Um, so what we've tried to do with the app is blend together three areas that sometimes are kind of bucketed. Uh, conversion tracking, uh, marketing attribution, and funnel analytics. So we've tried to combine those three areas together uh, within a seamless experience, uh, you know, and with kitchen sink sort of experience with so You'll see all those, con hopefully you'll see those concepts are kind of well blended together. Keys audio okay? Audio is great, Jeff, keep it going. All right, thank you. 
All right. So I first wanted to kind of start out. It's I, we tend to, you know, it's not invent yourself with like a funnel. And so this is like a typical uh, funnel where you've got some marketing responders, some marketing qualified leads, and then close one, right? What you're usually doing as a goal is for a one to 2% marketing response to a win. Some companies are lucky and they have more than the two to 4%, but typically it's a 1% marketing response to a, to a, a win. Uh, so this is a nice sort of foundational screen to start on. Uh, like Ronnie was saying, um, and, and the earlier, um, like some of the other, is MQL is also another foundational concept. So it's great you have marketing responders, but it's also nice to kind of look at what your conversion rate is off of marketing qualified leads. So you can actually change your orientation here and uh, organize around marketing qualified leads and it'll then calculate the conversion rate. It's doing the conversion rate automatically for you. And it's also doing the velocity. That's a key part of the question is, you know, how are these results happening? You know, is it, is it 20 days, 30 days, whatever. Uh, so that's kind of like the foundational concept of funnelness. And then on that, it gets into which of our campaigns are performing the best, right? So that's kind of the, usually the second question. Uh, so one, we try to make that easy to see in a full funnel manner. So you can, you can click on this area here and you can see which one of your marketing offers. So like webinars, reports, interactive tools, whatever, which one of those have the most MQLs or the most opportunities. You, you can see the names of the opportunities. So it's, it's very grand um, if you want to drill in and get the details. Uh, the other perspective, um, there's actually a lot of perspectives. As you can see, there's lots of different things you can view things by, um, what we call multidimensional. And the other perspective, what marketing tactic, like what traffic driving technique do we use to create the results? So like, you know, what medium was it? Uh, so then the classic debate of is it events versus digital versus organic search? You know, what are those, uh, how does that look and which one is performing the best? Uh, so it's really just a matter of perspective of how you wanna look at the results. Um, and you can, you can flip that around really easily. In terms of attribution, uh, if I wanted to answer the question, um, like Ronnie's example, what was the last campaign at MQL? I would, I would choose actual last, I would reorient the screen, and then I would then be able to see which one of my campaigns was most effective uh, as last touch MQLs. Um, so it's, it's pretty where you have funnel, attribution, and then uh, conversion tracking all kind of blended together. Uh, let's see. Next area that I would say is a big time saver is the recurring themes that you have around uh, like, is it digital marketing? You know, is events pushing, you know, moving the needle? Um, paid advertising, is, is that performing? Uh, how are webinars? Those recurring analysis that we, we do over and over, you can set up a funnel and, and sort of save that page. Um, so it, you, and then you can, you can say, well, let's compare marketing versus events, but I wanna do my analysis through the lens of opportunities being created. So it's, I can get a sense of, um, you know, how opportunities are being created. Oh, let me get the right one there. Uh, digital marketing versus events and, you know, how that's doing. Uh, you can also set up goals. I know that goals are really nice. Like it's ever in Salesforce reporting, uh, being up the dial is kind of like one of the first things people do. So it's nice to be able to put goals in that are pretty granular. So the events team can have goals. The digital team can have goals. Regional teams can have goals. And it's, it's easy to do that segmentation. Uh, and the app will automatically do the velocity. So to know which one of your marketing tactics have the best, you know, then you, you can see that pretty easily. Okay. So that's some, uh, three, you know, concepts blended together. Let me flip over and show some positive things that people use. So there's a lot of pushback on 
you know, Google advertising is really expensive. Uh, so you can go to this screen could say, well, show me the, you know, show me the money, right? You could say, uh, show me the opportunities that have influence from advertising. And so you just literally just type in CPC advertising, and then it'll show you the opportunities now down here below that have influence from Google advertising. Um, Anything you can think of, you know, you could search for content syndication or paid advertising, whatever. It's, it's kind of open ended. Uh, an another another uh, popular uh, marketing and sales are sort of talking about how they collaborated or didn't collaborate on an on an op on an opportunity. So you could type in a specific opportunity that you want to go do some analysis on, and you can click into uh, that opportunity and see the full journey. So um, I, can, I can go in and, and in a meeting, see the full story of, you know, how marketing made an impact, uh, what people were involved, what marketing campaigns those people engaged with and get sort of this atomic view uh, of the opportunity. So this, this is both online and offline. So I've got some, like, I've got some, uh, some email, some organic search, uh, some trade show influence. Uh, so it's both online and offline attribution at the opportunity level. And then if I want to go kind of meta and get like a really big picture, I can see the opportunity journey at the account level, and then I can get a bird's eye view and span across multiple opportunities. So if you wanted to, this one's nice when you're telling stories in a meeting and marketing and sales are talking about, you know, what worked and what was influential. You can pull this up and get a really nice bird's eye view. So, um, flipping over just to show you guys that, uh, the screen that Ronnie was highlighting around data quality. Uh, here's the actual screen itself. Uh, so yes, yeah, monitoring UTMs. If anyone made a mistake, you could hot fix that and you know, that it does retain the original date stamp. So any fixes along the way, the, the date stamps are retained. And it does that for medium sources and landing pages. So it, it, you can categorize your content very cleanly and keep that well organized. Uh, features that's pretty popular for uh, users is at the end of this cleaning process and uh, you know, you're your mediums and your sources and your content, all that's categorized. At that process, it can flow into uh, push into Salesforce. Uh, so this, this tracking structure that's really clean can flow over into Salesforce. And then I can see that in uh, like a lead view. So like I, could, I can be on a, like a lead detail on Salesforce and I can see the uh, rent metrics data within a Salesforce screen. And you have, you have two options on Salesforce data. We can put if campaigns like Ronnie was mentioning, that's one option. The other is we have a customer that we can push data into there. Uh, and then uh, it's pretty common to display rent metrics generated data on a, on a Domo screen. And so the way to do that is kind of a one, two, three. So rent metrics, the data organizes it, makes sense of it, then pushes it into Salesforce. A lot of times in, in a Domo example, it would be into the custom object. And then Domo would pull data custom object in Salesforce. Uh, so it's very complementary to something like a Domo because the role of rent metrics is to capture the data, organize the data, do the attribution, make sense of it, and then push it into, the, into wherever you need it to go. Most commonly is going into Salesforce. Um, that, that's kind of the nickel tour. Uh, I did want to highlight there are uh, just, you know, for time here, we want to leave time for questions, but a lot of different screens you can use. You can look at form fills, you can look at views. Uh, one that's very popular is to analyze MQLs, uh, like we were talking about. Uh, so you could, you could say which, how, how impact, which of our webinars influence the most MQLs. Uh, so you could get that really quickly. And then if you want to click into one webinar specifically, I can go in and get kind of the full story for an individual webinar, uh, kind of that full journey story. Uh, and this is nice because this URL is really clean. 
So you can bookmark this guy and you can share it with the team and everybody can kind of collaborate. So, um, all right, so that, that's, what I, that's kind of the nickel tour. Uh, I'll kind of throw it back and it will uh, open up for questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, really you. appreciate the demo. We, we definitely got a lot of questions that came in through this presentation. So we'll try to do our best to rapid fire through these. If we don't get through them all for some reason, um, we'll definitely make sure that the speakers follow up and address any questions directly. Um, this first question is for Devani. It's the two-parter. Um, do you use Domo as a data visualization tool or do you have it do data cleaning calculations, et cetera, as well? Um, and then second to that, how do you add to or structure your personnel to facilitate Domo? And was there a learning curve in terms of training? Yeah, absolutely. So great questions. Thanks, everybody. Um, so we use Domo for both data visualization as well as doing some calculations. We have a lot of reporting in there that talks to velocity, aging, all of that follow up, um, operational dashboard. So over time, as we've ramped up our use of Domo, um, Domo has usually been like the first to alert us that something's wrong with our data that needs to be addressed. Um, one great example is um, one of our executive leaders was looking at a report in Domo and he noticed that there was a spike on one specific day and we essentially went down a rabbit hole trying to investigate and we found out that there was a process maybe in that essentially marked a whole bunch of leads as MQLs um, and that was legacy data which should have never featured in there so oftentimes it has been sort of that first alert system um, but we do have calculations in there. So that's, that's part one. Um, part two is um, how we structure our team. So I will say Domo is very much, it is can be a full-time job depending on how it's used. So I would, in, the, in a past role, I've been exposed to Domo before here at Content Stack. And at the time we had somebody that was, that was dedicated to Domo. Um, and that was really helpful because as your business grows, you're gonna have new questions to answer. And that's going to need a lot more infrastructure building, a lot more Domo cars, a lot more SQL, um, as well as sort of educating people around you, right? In terms of the value that if you're looking for a specific remote that likely exists in Domo and you don't need to run that in Salesforce, for instance. Um, so that was how we've structured it um, in terms of needing a full-time resource. Initially, though, um, like I said in my presentation, we did have some external help to help tell that story. Domo is really not, and I think the best use of Domo is to do sort of like big picture reporting, trends, holistic analysis, as opposed to like one one off ad hoc reports. So I think that that lends itself well to somebody that can devote time and energy to iterating stories in Domo. Awesome. Thank you so much, Devani. Um, Jeff, really, Jeff, really quick, are you able to stop sharing your screen just so Ali can steal, steal back and go to the deck so we can wrap this one up? Um, uh, this next question is for you, Ronnie. Um, what other tools did you evaluate prior to selecting Ramp Metrics, and what was the implementation time for Ramp Metrics once you selected it? Yeah, absolutely. So we looked at all the, the standard ones that you would look at for trying to capture, you know, marketing attribution, including just, you know, doing it all manually through Marketo. Um, but we looked at Visible, uh, looked at a tool called Caliber Mind. Um, you know, so we just tried to figure out like what was going to be the best way. I mean, the, the main thing that we needed at the time was the, the capturing of the information in, in the structured way. You know, so like a lot of a lot of other tools, I mean, they're, they're more about analyzing things like after they're already in the right Salesforce campaigns and the right structure. So Remetrix, like it was the one that just sort of did it all in one for us. Um, and as far as uh, implementation, the actual getting up and running, um, I mean, we just installing the tracking script was pretty quick. And then the... Uh, uh, Salesforce uh, package install. Uh, I think we had that part all done within like a week. Um, I mean, it was really quick. Um, the part we took a little bit of uh, time was to just import um, all the historical data. So that took maybe a couple of weeks. And it's really just about normalizing like all the, the stuff that was in there already, like past webinars, past trade shows, you know, making sure that they're all aligned with the right member status and everything. And then uh, you, we would just go and select the um, the right fields that Randmetrics adds to the campaign object. And then Randmetrics would then suck it up into the platform to be able to push it with everything else. Awesome. And so estimated amount of time, you said it was pretty, pretty quick, a couple of weeks. 
Yeah, I think we were we were up and running and getting new getting data within the first week or two, um, and then with everything historical in there, I think we had everything done in under a month. Wow, that's that's awesome. Um, and Devani, for you with Domo, what was your implementation time? It definitely took us a little bit of time because as we sort of onboarded Domo, we realized that our, our time is best served by doing more high level, exec level reporting. And because of that, we essentially went exec by exec and tried to build to solve for their needs. Um, alongside that is also the user, user adoption story, right? In terms of educating people, in terms of saying, hey, let's, let's break the Salesforce mold and let's look at Domo and that's a lot of like marketing and sales alignment. So that's kind of how we did it. It took us a little bit of time. I would say probably a couple of months um, before we realized that what are the data anomalies we needed to address, what we needed to fix. So our infrastructure needed to get better and more optimized in order to support some of those big picture reports that we wanted in Domo. Awesome, I uh, really appreciate that. And um, this next question is for you, Jeff. Um, can you have touch points for multi-touch attribution other than SFDC campaigns and ramp metrics? Um, and then with that, are there other custom models possible with ramp metrics? Uh, right, so uh, for digital campaigns, the ramp metrics tracks the entire structure. And then at the end of that process, it pushes over into, it can go into the native object or the custom object. The, the inverse is also true. So uh, it, every couple hours, it pulls data from Salesforce. So like if you, like your trade show leads, leads uh, LinkedIn lead ad form, Facebook lead ad, those, uh, those things that are going into like your Salesforce campaigns, rent metrics can pick those up out of, uh, out of your Salesforce campaigns. And it does respect uh, your campaign membership. So like if, uh, like you, if you want to respect that it's a, a uh, that it's responded, campaign member status is responded, it will respect that logic and only pick up. Um, and then you you check a box and say, okay, we want rent metrics to pick this up um, automatically. Cool. Uh, there are some like advanced things around that where you can like web hook to rent metrics out of Marketo. Um, Zapier integration any, off of LinkedIn lead ad forms, all kind of, you know. Any SF, uh, SFTC activities available to be viewed in rent metrics as well? Yes, or yes. We can pick out. up the sales touches off of the activity object. Yes. Awesome. I think there was Perfect. one other one. Um, If you think of it, just let us know. But um, I'm going <laughs> to kick it back over one more question to both uh, both Ronnie and Devani. Uh, this question is, have you been successful partnering with sales operations? And how do you ensure the story being told by marketing reports is consistent with the story being told by sales reports? Um, just how, how have you kind of navigated that conversation? So for me, I, I kind of ninja'd my way into sales ops with uh, with the implementation of this, just with the uh, perspective of we are getting a marketing attribution tool to to analyze marketing touches, and because uh, we want to see like how our content is performing and how it's you know contributing and all this kind of stuff. Um, that pretty much opened the gates. Um, and, and then what ended up happening is just sort of organically, you know, as sales ops started seeing, you know, the data come in, like when an opportunity got created, there was a, um, uh, whatever the, the parent campaign or um, uh, automatically that, that gets supplied, like the last, the last campaign that they were on before they started an opportunity. Those started becoming RAM metrics campaigns, you know, because we were using the Salesforce campaign model to store our data. And so that actually ended up um, making things a little bit more accurate because you know they could easily tell for that because they were still rolling up those macro uh, lead sources on the opportunity, whether it came from marketing or sales. And so it just made it really easy for them to go in and see like, oh, okay, there's touches in here, you know, like this was a marketing thing. And um, so it, it, over time, you know, they embraced it a, a little bit further. And Devani? Um, having naturally curious sales team members helps. Um, they make the argument for 
knowing more automatically, right? They want to know who interacted before they submitted a, a call of what, how did that webinar do? When should they follow up? So it's kind of really interesting that it's the, the sales teams and the sales leaders that sort of fight the battle for you, right? It's being waged in another department, but the, the idea is everybody's really aligned. And I think that's kind of where it starts is to have really tight marketing and sales alignment. And then because they want the visibility too, marketing wants the visibility as well. So it's it's really not um, hard to be able to demonstrate value in terms of, hey, let's pivot our reporting from Salesforce, which can give you surface level data. But if you want a more granular approach, you're going to have to look elsewhere. And then that naturally transitions um, to people adopting Domo. It really helped that we were able to build and recreate a lot of the Salesforce reporting that the sales team and the sales leadership relied on within Domo. So that kind of was like, hey, instead of logging into two different systems, I'm just going to log into one. And that way I can see everything that I need to see. Awesome. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, Jeff, a couple more questions for you in the last minute of, minutes of this webinar. Um, the first one being, does rent metrics require the use of opportunities in Salesforce to measure attribution? And are you able to develop custom attribution models in rent metrics as well? Uh, if you weren't using the opportunity object and you were owning a uh, campaign responder, that's fine. Um, one of the strengths of the app in the loop all the way through to the pipeline, which would require you to put opportunities in Salesforce. If you, if you weren't, if you had more of a high velocity, it was really more just kind of tracking and responders, uh, you could still run rent metrics with only the, uh, the that first part of the funnel and take advantage of the second part of the funnel with the opportunities. And then uh, uh, kind of actually it would be a little, probably a little bit uh, we don't have enough time to totally get into it. The short answer is we keep it simple on attribution. Uh, we have a, a total elastic W fractionalization. Uh, there's a first and a last. Usually the question around custom funnels is more about can we apply the attribution to every in the and the, the answer is yes on that. If you're really getting into the granular details of like uh, setting up some sort of custom decay model or whatever uh, I'll talk to you about that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, Ali, can you hit the slide for me? Um, I guess just to wrap things up, because we are at time and I want to respect everybody's uh, end of the webinar. Um, I want to thank all of the, the speakers and panelists that joined us on the webinar today, Ronnie, Devani, and Jeff. I um, would also like to thank Grant Metrics for sponsoring this webinar. As a reminder, these, these brilliant professionals and 2,000 others are all existing in the Mops Pros community in Slack. So if you're not already currently in the Mops Pros community, I would definitely highly encourage you to, to join. Um, there's tons of questions that get asked, tons of vendor discussions, um, and really great content that happens in there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, with that, uh, Ali, one more slide. If you ever need to get in contact with Mops Pros, here are some of the details to do that. Um, and with that, I'm going to end it and say thank you to everybody who had joined and attended the webinar today. Um, really enjoyed the content and looking forward to, to the next webinar. So thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.